you know, nothing matters if the technology is not there. The technology can still fail if it doesn't get some sort of critical mass. Hello everyone today, our video highlight is of Lynn Alden. Lynn Alden is an investor, engineer, and writer with a focus on financial modeling and engineering economics, as per her website. She is the founder of Lynn Alden Investment Strategy. In this video, Lynn Alden talks about the government bonds and security structure, the role of banks, currency theft, Bitcoin as technology, and war of social opinions on it, with altcoins and lot insight on financial mysteries. If you enjoy this highlight videos, please kindly subscribe and help share this video for us to share more of this valuable content. Thank you. As its name suggests, Democrats' new budget reconciliation bill, the Inflation Reduction Act, claims it will help bring down inflation. The legislation is a landmark bill that makes massive investments in climate, tax, and healthcare policy and contains multiple provisions that could help achieve that goal. For one, the Congressional Budget Office has found that it's likely to reduce the deficit by up to $102 billion over 10 years, and perhaps more than $300 billion, depending on the proposal's final taxation rules. Deficit reduction, as well as other policies in the bill, could curb demand in the economy. Other provisions, meanwhile, could increase the supply of resources like energy. As the thinking goes, when supply is up and demand is down, prices decline. The bill's net impact on inflation, though, is likely modest and may not be felt for a while given how long many of these policies will take to go into effect. The Inflation Reduction Act is going to help the Federal Reserve to reduce inflation. It's not like it's going to cut the inflation rate from 9% to 2%. Very little effect will be felt in the next six months. For the most part, this isn't a bill about 2022. This is about 2023, 2024, 2025. It's about helping the Federal Reserve to fight against persistent inflation. It's not going to be bringing down the inflation rate in the month of September. Uh, and so basically during during the 1940s, uh, the Federal Reserve made an agreement with the Treasury and said that they will basically do yield curve control on the entire Treasury curve. So the short end of the curve, they were willing to – they basically had an unlimited bid. They could – because they can print money, they can print base money, they can have an unlimited bid to buy Treasuries if they start to go uh, above a certain yield, which means below a certain price. Uh, and it, because it's an unlimited bid, uh, you know, assuming that they stick with it, that can override all market forces. Um, and of course, the the only constraint to that is that you lose you lose value of the currency. Uh, but that's why they then go and block the exits as much as possible. So what they did was they you know for short end treasuries, short duration treasuries, they would lock them at three eighths of a percent, uh, and for long duration treasuries, they would lock them at two point five percent. And so so the whole kind of risk free government bond, you know, yield curve was a, a positive curve. That was submerged below the inflation rate, and they would support that by buying those bonds. And in the beginning, they had to buy a ton of them. Um, but eventually, the market kind of understands that this is not going anywhere, and so they they start just holding it. Because if you're if you accept the fact that you're stuck in this environment, then it becomes a question of okay, what is better than the other? Uh, and so, for example, they say, okay, well, if the short end, if the short end is near zero, I might as well buy the long end because at least I'll get some yield in this otherwise, you know, it's less negative in real terms if you have the longer end. And there's basically, you know, they start viewing it as a positive because there's no downside to that bond. Normally the downside of long duration treasury bonds, you know, you're, you're still nominally risk-free. Um, you generally have higher interest rates unless you're in a period of yield curve inversion, but the downside is you have more volatility, right? You could, you could lose quite a bit of value in a short period of time if the yields go up. But if there's yield curve control, Suddenly, those long duration bonds are pretty attractive. And that's actually what makes the 1940s different than the 70s. So, in the 70s, the way to protect yourself, other than owning things like gold and commodities and things like that, if you if you had to be in bonds, you'd want to own the short end because the short end could keep adjusting. You know, every three months or so, let's say you're holding three month T bills, you, you know, as the rates rose with inflation, which is what happened in the 70s because debt was low and they're trying to, to quell inflation, they weren't really doing financial pressure anymore. Um, it was smart to hold the short end of the curve because you you kept you know your your rate would constantly adjust higher, 
uh, to keep up with inflation, more or less. Whereas in the 40s, because they were doing yield curve control, it was actually made more sense to hold the long end of the curve. Because if if you were stuck holding zero or holding 2.5%, while inflation is averaging 6%, given the choice, you'd, you'd pick 2.5%. Uh, and so it created a different dynamic for what part of the treasury curve was attractive. And basically, it makes it so that once market participants understand that that's the environment that they're in, and that the exit doors are blocked, they start, you know, they, they start controlling the pricing for the Fed. I mean, every time yields would try to get above a certain value, the commercial banks would just buy those treasuries because they know that if they persistently stay above that value, they can just sell them to the Fed and get a spread uh, on the price. Uh, and so the market starts kind of policing itself um, once they determine that the central bank is credible uh, and that, you know, that basically they will backstop anytime it does start to persistently go above that level. That's kind of the key thing is that credibility, which is, of course, is kind of a, in this in this sense, a bad type of credibility, you know, the credibility that they're going to continue with their price controls, essentially. Um, but once they understand that's going to happen, they start self-policing. And so that's the key thing. That's kind of what makes the whole thing work along with blocking the exits. And then from there, they say, okay, well, now we want to make it so that there's restrictions on deposits. There's restrictions on on margins. Uh, of course, gold is banned. Uh, and then we use various either regulations, either force the banks to do something or heavily suggest to the banks that they that they do something like hold, hold treasuries. Um, and so those are essentially the toolbox for ensuring that rates are below the prevailing inflation rate, which which helps liquidate that government debt. In the current environment, you know, in, in the very near sense, it has been better to hold short duration stuff. So it's been better to hold cash. It's better to hold short duration treasuries um, because the long end has lost value. Um, uh, but I think, you know, in this environment, we're still early in the story, right? Um, you know, the, the, the Fed has not committed to yield curve control yet. Uh, and so I think, you know, this story is not fully written uh, and it remains to be seen what part of the curve will make sense to hold for the long, you know, for the whole the whole decade, let's say. Um, if yields stop going up uh, and they start to, you know, c- continue with their financial oppression to some extent, uh, then it'll start to accumulate where it's better to hold the long end of the curve generally. Um, but but of course, it, the whole spectrum is risky because you're, you're almost certainly going to lose out in real terms either way. And so let's say, for example, that you own gold and you're let's say you're even allowed to own gold and the currency essentially gets cut in half. So your gold doubles. Uh, well, you pay cap, you know, you're, you didn't really gain purchasing power with your gold. You just maintained it in the face of currency devaluation. Um, but now if you go to sell it for something else, you have a capital gains tax. Uh, and so you pay that to the government. And so at the end of the day, you you did not even break even. You also took a haircut. If, if Assuming your gold just doubled to compensate for the fact the currency was cut in half. Uh, so after tax, you know, you, you also participated in kind of the, the, the group, everybody getting a haircut, even if you were owning the quote unquote right asset. Uh, now that's, it could be better if you own something that goes up more than the underlying currency devaluation. Uh, so if you pick the strongest possible asset, you have a better chance there. Um, there could be, if there's enough kind of political uniformity against that asset, they can do special taxes on it. They can say, okay, well, Bitcoin's taxed at 80 percent because we, we've kind of deemed that to be, you know, you know, let's say they're not willing to ban it. They don't think they can ban it, but they're like, you know, that that's it, it's it's for criminals. Uh, you know, it, it's like extremist money. Uh, we're going to it's not it's not socially desirable. So we're going to tax that at 80 percent in Russia. If you if you are critical of the war, you can get multiple years in prison. Uh, for quote unquote spreading misinformation, right? If you're a Russian and you say, look, you know, we're, we're committing atrocities in Ukraine, this is an unjust war, uh, they can be like, okay, you're spreading misinformation, you're going to jail. And there's actually cases where someone turns in their neighbor uh, over this, right? Because there's, there's a, a substantial percentage of, of public buy in. And, and so, really, the, the odds of that sort of thing really come down to public buy-in that, that's a big part of it and i think that's why for bitcoin in particular you know it's not just it, the technology is a huge thing that's that's what enables all the peer-to-peer value transfer that that's what enables optionality that's what enables you know things to be different but i also think public education public advocacy 
uh, and, and basically moral arguments are also a key part of that, because if you're if you're a minority uh, and the and the majority is kind of unified against you, it's still very hard to operate uh, in that type of environment. I mean, obviously, the te- if there was no technology, if the technology was not as good, um, then the narratives doesn't matter, right? So so the, the te- at the end of the day, technology is everything. Um, but technology alone can still fail. I mean, if, if, you know, if, you know, if it's hard enough to use, if not enough people get it, if they're distracted by altcoins and, and scams in the, in the broader space, uh, that can make it hard. And obviously one of the attack vectors is energy, right? So especially during an, an energy crisis, uh, that's been one of the, you know, kind of attack vectors, uh, to go after Bitcoin. And I, that, you know, everyone has their own areas of research right so i you know i never focused on the nuances of soft forks and and you know what makes what makes one algorithm better than another algorithm that's not my area but with my electrical engineering background i do focus on the energy component to some extent uh to make sure that you know public is there are people out there basically i would say doing the opposite they're, that they're using propaganda to overstate the problems of Bitcoin's energy or, or things like that. They're like, you know, they'll say every Bitcoin transaction costs, you know, like a whole year's worth of cars, fuel or you know, whatever whatever the thing is, even though it doesn't actually map onto reality of how the network works. And so I, I do think it's important to push back on that because even if just some percentage of people that read it are then like, wait a second, that's not what I that's not what I was told by the media. Or that's not what I was told by a government official. That's not what I was I was told by other people maybe i should look more into this maybe this is more nuanced than i thought and, and so i do think that while the technology you know, nothing matters if the technology is not there the technology can still fail if it doesn't get some sort of critical mass to avoid some of the you know the hardest or even if it even if it wins in the long run you know it can still it can take much longer to win because of that social layer and individual users might not win Right. So even even if the technology wins in a long arc of time, doesn't mean that it wins with an individual user's lifetime or they could be, you know, in some way persecuted because of it. Uh, and so basically making it life easier for users of the network uh, and reducing, you know, the frictions against the success of the network. I, I think that social layer is very important. Um, and, and so there's different scenarios for how this works out. Um, and then there's also other scenarios where, you know, the, the attack vectors get worse. I mean, they go after proof of work money. They go after they, you know, the recent European term was, you know, unhosted wallet. Right. I mean, it, it, that really, that's a social layer thing because that comes down to word choice, right? Unhosted wallet doesn't sound good. It's like, well, we don't want unhosted wallet. That that's, that's what terrorists would use. Right. So, um, but that, that, that's, so that's, that's a matter of kind of controlling public opinion. So then it comes down to people pushing back against that and be like, okay, here's multiple reasons why unhosted wallet is a nefarious term. And it is better, you know, you can call them signers, right? You can call wallets like, you know, signers instead of wallets. There's all sorts of things you can do uh, to kind of, you know, because language is important. Uh, and so I think that there are multiple vectors here and it, it could be, you know, either going after a competitor, it could be saying, okay, you can use Bitcoin, but we want to use Bitcoin in our walled gardens, right? So you can, you can own it on exchanges, you can have it in the apps. Uh, but, you know, if you take it outside of that, that's an unhosted wallet. I mean, only, only terrorists would want to do that. Authorities in Israel on Monday put in place further restrictions on cash payments as a means to combat illegal activity and spur digital payments in the country. Some believe this will see an upswing in crypto uptake, but two experts are not so sure. Since January 2019, Israeli businesses and consumers have been subject to limits on cash payments under the law for the reduction in the use of cash. It's aimed at shifting the country's citizens and businesses toward digital payments, allowing authorities to more easily track tax evasion, black market activity, and money laundering. From Monday, the limits on cash payments have been tightened to 1,760 United States dollars or 6,000 Israeli shekels for business transactions and 4,400 USD or 15,000 shekels in personal transactions. If you enjoy this highlight videos, please kindly subscribe and help share this video for us to share more of this valuable content. Thank you.